this is a, a start from very far from Confucius and his quote. I don't know how many supremely wise or abysmally ignorant people do you meet on your work, but for sure, two days ago, I met one guy that probably was supremely wise. It's the CEO of a an e-commerce company in Italy, and he was absolutely sure that the process they are using in their company is perfect, and the only problem is due to people not being as good as they should. So I assume he was supremely wise. Anyway, uh, even if someone doesn't want to change, still a lot of people, a lot of companies do try to change for a number of different reasons, competition, market, technology, skills of people. Uh, they want to grow, gain market share. And the, the interesting thing is that typically you always hear this thing, oh, we need a, cult a culture change. <sighs> we will go back to that later, about this culture change thing. So there is a lot of things going on about change, a lot of noise, a lot of everything, but still, uh, it turns out that, let's say 70%, someone says 80, whatever the number is, we, actually we are not yet even sure how they are measuring this, but many initiative, change initiatives fail, right? 70% means that you probably shouldn't even consider starting, starting a change initiative. You have only 30% chances of succeeding. Is that true? Well, hopefully not. But it's even worse for lean. Uh, lean programs have uh, something like 95, 98% of failure rate. Hmm? So where does these problems come from? Uh, well, this is an ad of one of the big consulting fir firms. I pictured this in an airport uh, one year ago, more or less. Uh, well, it's <laughs> you know what's behind this, right? The main problem in companies are resources, not even people. The only issue is get more out of them, whatever that means. So these guys are really good at proposing the perfect recipe, the instant solution to all our problems. Uh, if you think about it, it's actually, once again, applying the Taylorist way of thinking uh, even to change. So the idea is that we can define best practices, and we know that the best practices don't exist, right? You only have good practice pertinent to your context, your tactical and strategic situation, your people, etc. And then this thing about a separation between people that think about work or change, in this case, and people that do the change. By the way, in a lot of cases, managers tend to feel like, oh, that's about my people changing. I can keep on doing the same things. The change is about them. Right? OK. So this ends typically in a, something like a big design change. It could be designed from internal people or from our consultant friends. It starts from a known point where, I don't know, it, is it clear enough? Can you see it? Right? Here it seems dark. So we are assuming we really know where we start from. And then there's this beautiful 
marvelous endpoint where that's pretty fine on paper from a few people, the elite guys knowing where you should go on, and then with some magic, you go there and reach the final destination. Uh, so a, a, a good question is, why do we still believe in fairy tales? Uh, there are a lot of questions about change, and there are, many are tough, and for sure they're difficult to answer, and sometimes we don't have an answer, or it's wrong. So in, in a tailor-oriented person or traditionally oriented organization, one of the first questions is, what will it cost us to change? And so immediately you, st immediately you start to think of change as a project with a Gantt and task assigned to people. Uh, but, and the cost of consultants, for sure. Uh, but then you, the, the real costs are typically hidden or not taken into account. Like, what will it mean for people to change the way to work? How long will this transition take? And how effective they will be after it? Another tough question is, well, what if we don't change? What will be the cost? This is a more difficult, but But first, this seems obvious, but a lot of, time, of times we, people really don't really know why they want to change. And I quote Torbjorn, that's probably in the other room now, that a few days ago tweeted this thing that perfectly uh, crystallized the problem. So there's a, a lot of confusion between wants and needs. I want to be lean. I want to do agile. But why? Do you really need it? So, that's a big issue. Uh, so, going back to our where do we start from and why? The, the first problem is how do we know that the system, our system isn't working? How? Maybe we have some metrics, some measures, and how will we know that it works after the change? And how will we know that it's because of the change and not because of other reasons, maybe combined? But one of the biggest issues is that everybody is so focused on change and process when changing. But the main issue is people. If people don't see the need for change, and typically managers assume that they, they are seeing it, uh, they will resist. It's normal. They will do anything to keep the status quo and will always look at this from the perspective of, okay, what do I get from this change? What's in it for me? Hmm? If they don't see the need and the benefit, they will do anything to uh, avoid it or just try to ignore it, hoping that it will go away, like the flu. Just a few days, an aspirin, and it's it. So people is, tend to focus much more on what they have to lose than what they have to gain. And so that's what the typical approach to change, that's something that is not addressed. People are skeptical. 
at the beginning. Maybe they have seen it a lot of times. Yet another change initiatives, yawn. So this should change. <laughs> and instead of a, a, a reactive kind of approach, like tell me what you want me to do, the point is to involve, to get buy-in is have people ask, how can I contribute? What's my influence? What's my involvement? That's rarely what's happening. And indeed, the typical words of change, I'm quoting Esther Derby here, are we're going to install change, to roll out change, to drive change, and then we go back to the mythical culture change that everybody is talking about. Uh, the point is that you can design a culture change. Culture change is an outcome. You cannot tra train people to have a new culture. They only get it doing things, working differently together, and being part of, of the change. That's how you reach that outcome. You cannot design it on paper. Still, language is very important because it's a, well, I would say lagging indicator, to quote Thornbjorn. But when people start using different words, different terminology, then that may be an indicator that a change has happened. Maybe. So, on one side we have the typical approach to change that we design it, we enforce it, we fix things with the change. While a different approach is to see change as something that's more, we, we have to discover what is the right change for us. We have to experiment and learn. So this is the legacy approach, and this is the modern one. So that's what Lynn Kanban pretends to be, a modern approach to management and to change. Actually, the, one of the most used definition is this one. It's an evolutionary approach to change. Evolutionary is a key word. So this means that we are not going for a revolution. Revolutions can be nice, but sometimes they end up miserably. And for sure there's, sorry, typically a lot of casualties on the ground left. And that's not the desired outcome. So, the Kanban method, I think everybody knows the principles so late in the day, so I will not spend too much time on them, except restating again that the idea is to start where you are now and not invent new roles, new responsibilities, new ceremonies or whatever. So we go for an evolution hmm? instead. And that's what the six core practices help us to do. Again, I assume you already seen this uh, through the day, so we'll not spend too much on that. But let's see for a while. You know, there's a, I think it was Peter Drucker that was used to say, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And in Kanban, the general idea is, is that if you can't see it, you can't manage it. In the case of change, well, this become, if you can't see it, you can't change it. And that's the first thing we do. Visualize what the hell is going on in our organization and where problems are. 
we typically use Kanban boards. This is just an example. We want to know what's going on, who is working on what, where are the issues. We want to expose these functions because that's where we are going to focus. Our needs are there, not our wants. And limiting WIP also applies to change because we, we do want to do only a few things at a time and not try to change everything at once. Again, also because if we try too many things in parallel, we will never know why we had the given outcome. Hmm? And so the focus is on having workflow and change flow. So instead of typical change initiatives that are never too much visible or too many in parallel, as I was saying, or the idea of sticking to a plan and doing a lot of things in parallel that then end up in stuck things. That, that's what the first three principles, uh, practices of Kanban help us to do. And going back to Deming, one of his point was we need to understand the system. And so how do you know where you are? and what's going on. That's what the visualization part of Kanban takes care of. And then the idea is to have quick feedback loops and trying to set a reachable, even if challenging, goal in terms of change, but only validated through measuring and learning. We set a goal, we measure what's happened, and we learn from what uh, happened. That's basically the scientific method. So these measures are not measures for incentives or whatever. These are just focus on our change initiative to check if and what is going on and if it's working. This means, and that's one of the six properties, the sixth uh, property, uh, we can uh, fail. It's safe to fail. That's the sixth property. So we accept that we will be doing small steps and some will be discarded because we don't know if they will work. We will just try, but we will try to fail quickly and learn from our, our failures. So the good ones will be embraced and the loop will start again. And then again, from Deming, we need to understand human psychology. So we need to show progress, share with people if and how we are making advances and use what we show, the board and the data, whatever, to decide collabor collaboratively how to move on, and not in a top-down way like it's happening usually. So whenever we have to select what to do, and this applies to projects in a portfolio or to task in, in a project, but even to change initiatives, hmm? the point is that a, a well-designed Kanban system will help us in taking the best decision and leaving, keeping our options open until uh, they are still value. So this means that we accept the fact that we live in, in an uncertain and complex world. And so every decision is a balance between understanding the risk and the possible return and balancing, balancing between the two and decide again collaboratively what to do and balancing short term or long term. So there's no known destination, unfortunately, for the big consultancy guys. 
And change is uh, something that is not ending. It continuously moves on. So no known destination means that our target moves because we learn more and more who we are and where we want to go. And this is in constant evolution. But we have to be where because our changes will move us to a better place. Sometimes we will go back, as we were saying. But the, there is a natural tendency to people to either declare victory or give up and sit on their laurels. That's, that's the risk in an evolutive approach of saying, OK, that's good enough or this is not working, and we stop. So keeping the energy is tough, and that's someone that should always be very carefully considered. So you either are supremely wise or abys abysmally ignorant. So we take the blue pill when Morpheus gives it to you. You could take a red one and have a disruptive or fairy tale change. But the idea here is that you probably prefer something else. And that's neither nothing or too much disruptive. And it's an evolutionary path to an unknown, but for sure much better destination. So. Kanban is a lot about changing and transforming organization more than moving stickies around. Mike is here, by the way. <laughs> so I'm happy to quote him. And that's it. That's me. It was a quick one. Uh, if you have any questions, I think we have a f few minutes or not. The Snoopy one? Oops. So the question is, how do you? No, sorry. Forgive my ears, but. I'm just wondering, how do you not end up like this? How do you? push yourself to constantly change. We are in this position where we are in a happy place where mm -hmm. I could say we deliver, but I'm falling asleep. And the question is how not to? Yeah, but for sure, uh, uh, one of the, the fourth Kanban principle is um, encourage active leadership at all levels. That means that anybody in the organization should notice this and help uh, the rest of the organization to move and to go in the right direction. For sure, in all the uh, loops I, I, I was talking about in terms of defining where we want to go, measuring it and learn, should never end. If, if you stop doing that, that's for sure a signal that something like this is happening. Hmm? The problem is the problem. The problem is avoiding uh, going over problems. That's something uh, that we get used to. Okay, something doesn't work, but okay, we get the product delivered anyway. Who cares? And we go on and we accept um, small uh, glitches, hiccups, and these they become bigger and we don't notice them anymore, etc. You know, in Toyota, there's this thing that's the undone cord in lean uh, production system where anybody can pull the cord if he, if he notice that there's something wrong in the process. And they have to do it. 
and they have to stop it. I mean, the line, the flow, because they want to address that immediately. So that's a culture change. After a while that you do this, you get into this mindset of not accepting any uh, hiccup, any problem, but going immediately to fix it. I'm just going to suggest an answer that was based on one of the other practices, and that was on feedback loops. I think if your change is all internally driven, at some point you may run out of steam. If, if you have feedback loops that are encouraging improvement from outside as well, um, then I think you're, in a, you're, you're more likely to sustain it. Yeah. Okay, it's been a long... Oh, sorry, there's one more question. <laughs> Thanks for bringing the microphone. That wasn't your job. <laughs> so um, just an observation from you, I suppose, really, uh, based on your coaching experience. I mean, mm -hmm. where, where you've been. You gave us a good example of the CEO who perhaps wasn't quite ready for this process to begin. Maybe some of his people were. But what are the traits that you've seen looking from outside into an organization where, where you've seen more success versus less in terms mm. of this process? Oh. Well, I've worked and I'm working with many different kinds of companies, big ones, smaller ones, companies doing IT, others doing machinery. But there are some patterns that are uh, always recurring. And for sure, uh, every time a change initiative is being designed by the top guys, without involving the people, then I've never seen it working. I, before being a coach, I also worked for software companies and machinery companies. So I've gone through lean introduction programs, business process engineering, all this kind of stuff. And for sure, if you start top down, it doesn't work. Does it work if it starts bottom up? Mm, that's something also I've seen rarely work. You get some, uh, how do you say, uh, traction, but the gravity of the rest of the organization then pulls that back to the initial state. So you need both. For sure, you, have, uh, you need a lot of involvement from people doing the real work, but you need sponsorship from the top, otherwise, I, at least. That's obvious to say, but then that's what I've seen happening. <laughs> I don't remember any big exception to this. Okay, thank you. Thank you.